welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I'm your host, Rob Skiba. I'm going to pick up where we left off last time, and we left off getting ready to read the chapter blog titled, The First Shall Be the Last. If you want to follow along with me, you can go to seedtheseries.com forward slash blog, and then click on the link, The First Shall Be the Last. So, let's get started. The first shall be the last. Someone once asked me, what is the purpose of prophecy? To which I responded, to prepare us for things to come. And I truly believe that. So if that is true, do you really think God would leave us hanging concerning the details of major events in what we call the end times? In Mark 13, 19, Jesus said that there has never been a time like those coming days, and there never will be again after they have finished. That's pretty serious. Therefore, when looking at the key players that have been written about concerning those last days, should we not find some major clues to help us determine who they are? Should we not be able to look at Scripture and determine exactly who the coming Antichrist is going to be so that we're not deceived? Obviously, I believe the answer is a resounding yes. So far, we have seen that prior to the flood, Lucifer and his angels did most of the dirty work themselves. They had direct interaction with humans leading them into sin, death, and destruction. But after the flood, we saw that a man rose up, empowered by the devil to oppose God and his children. He did this at the Tower of Babel. Thus, the first Antichrist figure arose. His name was Nimrod. There, he tried to kill God and set up a new order with himself serving as the God of this world. The work of the devil began to take place through a human being, apparently of Nephilim descent. After God foiled Nimrod's plans, the population of the world was divided into 70 nations, each ruled by an angelic principality and each people group telling stories of a God-man who was their leader. He went by many names. Each of those names carried with it a legend, story, or myth that involved the concept of resurrection. We ended the last section by drawing attention to some of the various names Nimrod has been known by, focusing specifically on the names Gilgamesh, Osiris, and Orion. If you are following along with me uh, online, there's a picture of the Orion constellation uh, where the stars, there are lines connecting the the stars, connecting the dots, so to speak, with a a kind of a drawing superimposed on it of uh, the mighty hunter, Orion. And in his left hand, he's holding a a lion uh, by the throat. And in his right hand, he has a club as if he's about ready to strike the head of the lion. So uh, as you look at that picture, what I find interesting about the usual depiction of Orion is that he has a lion in one hand and a club in the other. He's also facing the Taurus bull, uh, constellation Taurus. And there's a link there that will take you to a bigger picture that will show you the uh, constellation Taurus, which is just on the other side uh, behind the, um, the lion's back. Bull worship was very popular in the days leading up to and during the time of Moses. Bull worship was also strongly associated with Baal, who is yet another name for Nimrod, as noted above. And actually, Baal is just a uh, kind of a generic term for Lord, but Lord not so much as in like a landlord or something like that, but Lord is in the sense of God with a little g, usually um, in reference specifically to sun gods, which were almost always, if not always, directly related to Nimrod, just by different names. So here you have a mighty hunter facing a bull about to smash a lion, or so he thinks. We know that one of the titles for Jesus is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Even as we look at the imagery to the left and we contemplate the last days, it may be tempting to think that the Antichrist is winning the battle. He has his hand raised to strike the Savior. Looks pretty bleak, doesn't it? But recently, the Lord brought me to another passage of Scripture that fits this analogy perfectly. Now, when I look at the arrogance of Nimrod Orion, I cannot help but think of Revelation 5.5, which says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. And when we keep reading in the book of Revelation... We are reminded that we win in the end. The club of Nimrod will never strike the head of the lion. In fact, just the opposite is going to happen. 
The seed of the woman will finally crush the head of the serpent, just as the first prophecy in the Bible says. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In the Old Testament, one phrase stands out above all others as the description for the Antichrist. That phrase is the Assyrian. Look again at the picture of Orion and consider this passage from Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5, which says, Woe to the Assyrian, the rod of my anger, in whose hand is the club of my wrath. The Lord goes on to address this individual again in chapter 14, verses 24 and 25, where he says, The Lord Almighty has sworn, Surely as I have planned, so it will be, and as I have purposed, so it will happen. I will crush the Assyrian in my land. On my mountains I will trample him down. His yoke will be taken from my people and his burden removed from their shoulders. There is much that could be written concerning the Assyrian in Scripture, but this is all I really need to write about here to make my point. For more amazing insights on the Assyrian, click here to read the article Peter Goodgame wrote for Raiders News Network, and there are links there for you to check out. Nimrod was known as the Mighty Hunter. Orion was known as the Mighty Hunter, and so was Gilgamesh. Notice the quote in the middle of the bump out of the BBC article above, and that's from the previous uh, reading, uh, the previous chapter blog called The Man of Many Names. There was a, a BBC news article that I, I copied and pasted into this document. Uh, and there's a bump out in, in that article. It's from the portion of Tablet 1 of the Epic of Gilgamesh. The extended version of that passage reads, Who can compare with him in kingliness? Who can say, like Gilgamesh, I am king? Whose name from the day of his birth was called Gilgamesh? Two-thirds of him is God, and one-third of him is human. Let's compare that with Revelation 13, 3 through 4. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And i got a side note here. According to the book of Joshua, Esau cut off the head of Nimrod, Gilgamesh, Osiris, Orion, and so looking at that uh, comparison again from the Epic of Gilgamesh where it says, who can compare with him in kingliness? Who can say like Gilgamesh, I am king? Consider what it says in Revelation. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Why would the whole world call a man the beast and follow him? I believe this will happen because so many cultures already have some sort of connection to him through myth, legend, and or religion. Something seriously freaky happened, like a mortal head wound being healed, and the man was a giant, a beast. When this 4,000-year-old beast rises up from under the Giza Plateau out of the water, it will truly be an astonishing, miraculous sight. A modern-day giant Frankenstein godman rising from the dead. It's like, cue the freaky music and the thunder sound effects, and the people will shout, It's alive! Let's take a closer look at this beast. Revelation 17 confirms once and for all who the end-time Antichrist is going to be. Further, I will show you what I believe to be absolute proof, straight from the lips of Jesus, that seems to confirm this theory. Revelation 17 is where John sees the vision of the beast with seven heads. He is confused as to the meaning of this vision, so the angel tells him what it means. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Revelation 17, 8 through 11, the King James Version. The beast that was introduced in Revelation 13 is described here in Revelation 17 in more detail. So here we have the guardrails or boundaries within which we must stay when considering who the Antichrist was, is, and will be. Note that the angel describes the seven-headed beast by saying, first, that we must have wisdom when looking at it. In other words, we are challenged to think this through. 
The angel then goes on to say that there are seven kings that we need to pay attention to. In context, the creature described here is one with seven heads, meaning there have been seven individuals in history that were all of one body, that of Antichrist. The angel tells John that five have fallen, one currently is, that of course being at the time of John, and another will come, but reign only for a short time. Peter Goodgame believes the following individuals represent the seven heads of the beast, and I tend to agree. He lists first, Nimrod. Without a doubt, he is the first Antichrist figure described in the Bible. Second, the Pharaoh of Egypt at the time of the Exodus. Again, a man arose thinking himself to be a god and whose motives were to enslave and wipe out the children of the one true god. Third, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria who also thought himself to be a god and who sought to rise up against the whole one of Israel, only to instead be humbled by the Lord and sent home, where he was murdered by his two sons. Fourth, the king of Tyre. Another king described as a man who thought himself to be a god, then described as Lucifer himself in the Bible. And that's an interesting narrative if you read that. And each of these have, uh, there, there are links that you can click on to read more about these individuals, both uh, from history as well as from the Bible. The king of Tyre actually just starts off with uh, a description of a man, and then right in the middle of the narrative, it starts talking directly uh, about Lucifer. So uh, clearly this man has some kind of strong tie with Lucifer. Good reason to believe he was the fourth Antichrist, seven head of the heads. Fifth, Antiochus Epiphanes. He set up an altar to Zeus in the Holy of Holies and offered up a pig as sacrifice, creating an abomination in God's holy temple. This, of course, foreshadows what the last Antichrist will do in the third temple. Those are arguably the most likely candidates for the five who have fallen. Now, there is some debate about the one who now is. Of course, again, now is being at the time John wrote the book of Revelation. The identity of, of this person depends on when John actually wrote the book of Revelation. It must have been a Caesar, but which Caesar was it? Nero or Domitian? The belief I hold to is that it was Nero. It must def he most definitely fits the description of a demon-possessed madman hell-bent on destroying God's people. The seventh is the one who has not yet come and yet shall reign for a short period of time. I believe this has to be Adolf Hitler. Again, uh, he definitely fits the description of a demon-possessed vicious world leader who blatantly stood in the face of God. Hitler murdered millions of the Holy One of Israel's people, and he did so in the manner of a Luciferian occult-like ritualistic fashion, including massive human sacrifice. If he is just a foretaste of what is to come, the last Antichrist will truly be a monster, a weapon of mass destruction unlike anything ever seen before. My personal opinion is that the last Antichrist is going to embody um, traits of all of these. So here we have all seven most likely candidates from history. These are the seven heads of the beast, but notice the next verse that the Bible, that most or very few Bible scholars, I should say, ever seem to pay attention to. It says, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven. It says that the beast that was and is not and yet shall be is the eighth who is of the seven. Actually, the terminology of was and is not and yet shall be is mentioned a few times in Revelation 17. I believe this is there for those who have wisdom to take notice. First of all, it is the antithesis of the description for Jesus in the first few chapters of the book of Revelation as the one who was and is and is to come. You see that over and over and over again in the beginning of the book of Revelation. Uh, you hear the phrase uh, in heaven, the angel saying, the one who was and is and is to come. Second, it fits the numerous beliefs of the ancient world concerning their dying and resurrecting sun god. But the fact that Revelation 17.11 says that he is of the seven means the last and most infamous Antichrist has to be one of the seven listed above and will probably embody the traits of all of them combined, as I said earlier. Now, if we look at the description of Revelation 13 again, we find that this individual had a mortal head wound that was miraculously healed. So looking at the list above, we need to ask which of these had a mortal head wound. Nimrod, yes. 
Pharaoh of Egypt? No. Sennacherib, king of Assyria? No. King of Tyre? No. Antiochus Epiphanes? No. Nero? Yes. Well, sort of. It is said that he stabbed himself in the throat, and there's a link there for you to check out. Hitler? Yes, but again, sort of. History says that he shot himself in the head. However, recent DNA forensic evidence seems to suggest otherwise, and you can click on a link there uh, to see what I'm talking about as well. But for the sake of argument, let's just say that we have three out of the seven who fit that description. Nimrod, Nero, and Hitler. Now, which of those three is an Assyrian who has any connection to Babylon? Only one. Nimrod. I got a note here. While Sennacherib was indeed an Assyrian, he never had a mortal head wound to the head. A mortal wound to the head. So even if the above list of candidates is not accurate, I believe a very strong case can be made for at least the first and the last names on the list, that being Nimrod and Hitler. We can debate all day long about the rest. The bottom line is, no matter what list you put together for the seven, no person in the recorded history of this planet fits all descriptions for the Antichrist better than Nimrod. And if we were to apply Occam's razor, the simplest explanation is most likely the correct one, to this analysis, I believe the results would speak for themselves. So, we can forget about any and all notions, theories, and or ideas regarding any current political figure currently walking this earth. That means Obama is not the Antichrist, neither is Ahmadinejad, Osama bin Laden, Putin, Prince William, or anyone else. No other actor on the world stage fits the part better than Nimrod. Perhaps the biggest and most recent revelation concerning Nimrod as the Antichrist is the coincidence concerning his percentages as a godman. My wife and I were discussing something this morning at the time when I wrote that, and she kept uh, talking about the ratio of two-thirds. All of a sudden, another piece of the puzzle fell into place. Look at Revelation 13, 18. It says, This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. That's from the NIV version of the Bible. Notice how the Epic of Gilgamesh states that he was two-thirds God and one-third man. Right there, you have two extremely important number percentages. One-third is approximately 33.3%. In the Illuminati and in secret societies in general, 33 is a significant number, and one we will deal with a lot more in the blog I've titled Jesus by the Numbers coming soon. In that section, I will show the significance of the number 33 as it pertains to the Nephilim, to Jesus, as well as to the rise of the Nephilim and their Antichrist. More on that later. Now as to Nimrod Gilgamesh, uh, and his other percentage, you probably already know where I'm heading with this. Yes, two-thirds. If we calculate the number of the beast with that insight in mind, we end up with approximately 66.6%, or 666. All right, let's bring it all together now. We've already built a case for worldwide worship of this man by many other names. He was considered a godman by many cultures. Part god, part man? Hmm, where have we heard that before? Jesus Christ is both god and man. Both were called the king of kings and lord of lords. Both have a cross as a symbol. Both are known as a dying and resurrecting figure, though Nimrod has yet to do so. One is the Christ, one is the Antichrist whose God number just so happens to calculate out to 666. Earlier, I promised to show you something directly from the lips of Jesus that I believe proves all of what I'm saying here to be true. Consider Matthew 24, verses 24 through 28, where Jesus says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, in other words, pay attention. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the, in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning shineth out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, 
so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. King James Version. Notice Jesus said, Behold, I have told you before. I like the way the New Living Translation renders that first part. Backing up to verse 23, it says, If anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. See, I have warned you about this ahead of time. In other words, I believe Jesus is saying, pay attention. This is serious, guys. Even you could be deceived by what is going to happen. He then mentions the desert. Gilgamesh was found in the desert. He mentions the secret chambers. The the tomb of Osiris was found, and it most certainly was and is a secret chamber. And I have a link there. Click here for some more interesting information and videos about this find, and there's an artist rendering of it, uh, so you can see how extremely interesting the tomb of Osiris really is. But the last statement, Jesus says, makes no sense at all in any other context. He says, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. The correct translation is eagles, but modern translations change the word to vultures. You may see that in in your Bible, depending on what translation you're reading. Uh, Because everyone knows that eagles don't go after dead things, i.e. a carcass. They hunt live prey. So the translators changed the scripture to match their flawed understanding. The truth is, Jesus knew exactly what he was saying. Imagine that. I believe Jesus prophetically looked forward in time and saw eagles gathered around a corpse. The eagle has been the emblem of choice for nearly every major world empire on this planet, past and present. The eagle is, of course, the national symbol for America. Some of our elite military units proudly display the eagle in various places on their combat uniforms. Colonels wear the eagle on their shoulders, and the eagle is also prominently displayed on the hat, collar, chest, shoulders, and buttons of our military's dress uniforms. And I've got a picture right there just circling the many eagles that can be found on a typical military dress uniform. Americans proudly display their blessed eagle all over the place, from our currency to our national seal, our government buildings, monuments, the uniforms our soldiers wear, motorcycles, flags, flagpoles. You simply cannot escape the American eagle imagery. Therefore, is it any wonder that Jesus described eagles when he looked forward in time and described what he saw concerning the revival of the one who would claim to be the savior of the world in the last days. And I've got some more pictures showing Navy, Army, and Marines, and some other patches in a a little statue of an eagle, just showing how prominent the eagle really is to America. And where are America's eagle-wearing soldiers now? Well, they are in Iraq, Babylon. And we went there one month after supposedly finding the tomb of Gilgamesh. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. At prophecy meetings, people always like to ask, where is America in prophecy? After all, we are, at least at the time of this writing, the world's superpower nation. Should we not imagine that America would therefore be mentioned in prophecies concerning the last days? Especially if we are to believe we are now in those last days or rapidly approaching them. The usual assumption is that something knocks America out of that superpower status, and thus we are not a relevant power in the end times scenario. While I will grant that could be a possibility, I believe a stronger case can be made for America's role in the last days being depicted in that passage of Matthew 24, verses 24 through 28. Unfortunately, if this is true, that means we are not playing on the right team. Because the implication, then, is that America is busy resurrecting the Antichrist and setting up his future empire. I will elaborate on that later in the section called The Omega Plan. This conclusion sounds harsh, I know. But considering the Masonic occult roots of our nation's founding, the layout of our government's capital city, and there's a link for you to check out there, The numerous monuments and statues that glorify Babylonian, Egyptian, Greek, and Roman deities 
And all that has happened since 9-11 to set up, a, set up a new world order, it's hard not to come to that conclusion. Now let me pause for a moment here and encourage you not to question my patriotism. Just because I am pointing out facts that are hard to accept concerning our nation, that does not mean I am anti-America. I love my country. And I've got three pictures there showing my career path in the Army, from uh, being part of the 3rd Battalion, 48th Infantry, to becoming a helicopter crew chief slash door gunner, and eventually becoming a helicopter pilot. I am a third-generation Army veteran who proudly served this country for eight years of my life. Though I never had to see combat, thank God, I was willing to lay my life down to protect this country and still am, if need be. In fact, at one point in my military career, I volunteered to serve in Desert Storm three times. So again, I say, I love this country, and please do not question my patriotism. But just because I love this country, that does not mean I agree with everything our government does or has done in the past. And the Constitution that I swore to uphold, defend, and protect affords me the right to express these views, at least for now it does, anyway. For a better understanding of where I am coming from, and before you are tempted to crucify me for making such statements as those made regarding our country's founding and her ongoing involvement with all things concerning Osiris Nimrod, I highly recommend that you watch the following two movies by filmmaker Chris Pinto. And I've got two full-length documentary videos there uh, embedded on the webpage. One is for a documentary called The New Atlantis, and the other is Riddles in Stone. Both are over two hours long, but well worth the viewing. I highly encourage you to watch them. Now, through these two videos, I believe Chris Pinto has done a magnificent job of exposing America's role in the end game. And I believe I've made a solid case for Nimrod being the first and most certainly the last Antichrist. I will therefore conclude this section with a quote from Peter Goodgame's The Assyrian article. Uh, and there's a link right there for you to go check out the full article. But this is uh, two paragraphs that he wrote in that article. Uh, Peter Goodgame says, Following the successful American invasion of, of Iraq and subsequent occupation, there are many Bible scholars who are looking at the end times prophecies of this region with renewed interest. Many of them believe that the Bible predicts the literal rebuilding of Babylon, the great harlot of Revelation 17.1, along the banks of the Euphrates River. They follow along with the views of Arthur W. Pink, who in 1923, in his comparative study of the Antichrist, there's a link for you to check out, pointed to Zechariah 5, verses 5 through 11, which speaks of the habitation of a wicked woman being established in the land of Shinar. Will ancient Babylon be rebuilt in the last days and somehow emerge in control of the political and economic structures of the world in fulfillment of Revelation 17 through 18? Of course, now that the U.S. military controls Iraq, we can be sure that if a rebuilt Babylon does emerge, it will happen only through the support of the U.S. government. 